How are you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji, host of Tear Talk, and today I am at the prestigious Seton Hall inside the Science Center at the McNulty Building, and we're here to host the NJACA, the Division of Continuing Education and Professional Studies from Seton Hall University, and the New Jersey Association of Criminal Justice Educators sponsored event called Too Much Hate. The realities and challenges of public safety and as you can see we've got a little noise going on because getting people ready to sign up again this is an event that's sponsored by the NJACA the Division of Continuing Education and Professional Studies at Seton Hall University as well as the New Jersey Association of Criminal Justice Educators the moderator of today's event is John Patakis yeah John welcome to Seton Hall University <clears throat> we're having our annual conference uh, today on the campus of Seton Hall at the McNulty Science Center and in the amphitheater. Uh, this conference today is dealing with hate crimes and bias crimes, and we have a host of presenters representing different areas of the prosecutor's office, homeland security, psychology, <coughs> um, and victimology. All right? uh, <coughs> uh, this is the cooperative effort between the New Jersey Correction Association, the criminal justice educators, and the Department of Continuing Ed and Professional Studies here at university. Uh, center. Uh, we expect a crowd of about 60 professionals coming in the field and there'll be an opportunity to interact, uh, to study some case studies and also have some uh, further discussion on this matter. Okay. I'd like to uh, welcome all of the New Jersey Correctional Law Enforcement Professionals, researchers, administrators, and educators who have come to see Hall today to talk about hate. Then we get people to stop doing the destructive behaviors that they're doing, the ones that are destructive to themselves and to society, and we're trying to put them back out there so they can be, you know, tax-paying citizens. What is bias? What is hate? And what is prejudice? If we start with those terms, we're, we will work our way through the statute a little easier. So I'm coming right back at you, just kind of going through the events here, and we had a great clash just now that I took on prosecuting hate crimes. Now, Bob Riccadello, the president of the NJACA, I gotta tell you something, first off, the event is going great, by the way. Great job in organizing what you're doing. Great, great job to get the information out there. Uh, before we introduce the instructor to the course, I just wanna ask you, why do you feel there's a need for this type of class, prosecuting hate crimes? Well, I think we're seeing in general today in American society, we're seeing a rise in hate crimes. Uh, there are a lot of different things going on politically and just uh, some of the stuff that's going on around the world and now we're starting to see it in the, uh, the law enforcement arena, the prosecuting arena. So we felt that this was a very timely and, uh, and very relevant uh, issue to, uh, to do a seminar on today. Right, and I definitely saw a lot of interest from the class, by the way. The class was very interactive. There was a lot of good interaction because, you know, in the room you have people from all levels of, you know, you know, people who are out on the streets as investigators, people from the prosecutor's office, people from corrections, people from parole. So you had a pretty diverse group in there. And all diverse, obviously they have a part, they have a, they have a, a, a particular relationship to what was being taught. And the reason why I also felt that the interaction was there was because of the wonderful instructor that you provided for us. So do you mind uh, introducing We have uh, Kathleen Holly is an assistant prosecutor with the Somerset County Prosecutor office and her expertise is in hate crimes. Well, I just got to say, I took the class, you know, I, I believe the class was amazing, very informative. I love the fact that you were able to get the interaction and, and you didn't just teach from the book. There's knowledge there that you put out there and that you could see it came from you. That's why you welcome questions. I noticed that when you have those confident instructors, they want the interaction because they want the questions because either way I can teach you or I can learn from those questions. So do you feel that a class like this from your perspective uh, is needed? Um, I do, and I first would like to thank my prosecutor, Robertson, for permitting me to come here and address you folks today. I do feel these classes are necessary. I often go to community groups and uh, churches and schools because in order to uh, avoid this and to mitigate this, we need to educate all levels from childhood on up as to how to avoid this and how to learn about our differences and learn about bias, prejudice, and hate so we don't find ourselves in a situation where we're, where we're committing bias crimes. Right, and I, and I noticed that there were a lot of real life case scenarios that were being tossed out there. And I noticed that uh, there was a peak towards juveniles at the end and it just kind of, everybody started getting involved. What was the interest with juveniles in prosecuting hate crimes? I think from the audience comments, what I noted was there were a number of investigators who saw a rise in juveniles committing bias type offenses or crimes. And I think uh, what's important is that 
we get the message out to those juveniles, whether we go to the schools or we go to the community events, to, to teach them the error of their ways so they don't continue down this path and continue to commit crimes and hurt people and victimize people and then when they become adults they will find that they're in a situation where the penalties are greater. So, so I think, as I said in my comments, we need to educate them and then if we do have the, the means in the investigation to charge them and a charge is warranted, uh, a charge needs to be lodged. And then I believe your, uh, to your comment was sometimes juveniles need structure or need to be in a placement situation so you can actually get through to them. In the, uh, well, well, two things. First of all, this is really relevant with juveniles because the juveniles are online today and they're seeing a lot of the hate speech that's out there and, and then they mimic it. They, you know, they, they, they see what goes on at home, they see what goes on online and that's why I think you're starting to see a rise in it. But to get back to that point, you know, juveniles, some of them in the, in the system, we bend over backwards to keep them out of any sort of incarceration situation. But then there are times where we really need to sit them down and put them into some programming that's in a controlled environment so that they really get it. It's not just about warehousing anybody, it's about getting them programming, getting them to change destructive behaviors that, that are offensive to a lot of people, offensive and hurtful to a lot of people. Because we live in such a diverse society, we need to respect that. And you know what's great is, I, I have a feeling that people don't realize that there is a balance, and not an isolation, a balance of uh, rehabilitation and obviously safety and security. And at one point, like you're right, if all efforts are exhausted, then yes, to maintain safety, you may have to remove that individual, but doesn't mean that individual is forgotten. And for some reason, society feels that, well, it's totally punishment. No, there is an aspect where, yes, the person's been removed, and like the young lady mentioned here, there is a punishment perspective, yes. But don't think that's an isolation of anything else progressive, because at the end of the day, we know that this person has to move forward, has to be productive. I just feel if there was a better connection between what's in the system, because people will eventually know that, yes, there's exist, it exists, there's hope in the prison system, what can we do to take that out into the streets, the transition? Well, I, I think education, I think, I think Kathleen's uh, seminar today was, is fantastic because, again, it was everybody from inside the criminal justice system, from people who were providers who work on the programming, and then people who are out in the street and dealing with this he you know, hands-on, and then the prosecutor's office who somehow connect the two in, a, in an attempt to, to adjust behavior. And my hope would be that the people that attended this course may take this information and spread the word and use it in uh, their work and in their environments when they're dealing with these people. Right, if I just may say in closing, uh, first off again, I'm gonna thank you again, Bob, probably for each video that we do for bringing these great instructors to us. Bob, the president of New Jersey, uh, America's uh, Correctional Association, as well as myself as an executive board member, which mm -hmm. is great, I'm honored. Uh, they really do whatever they can to make sure they get the best and they also get what's needed because it's being requested. And also just for a wonderful class that you provided, it wasn't someone who just sat there and riffed from a PowerPoint, it was someone that welcomed interaction. And I believe that's needed now, especially in training because there's, you know, evolution, things are changing. And sometimes we get instructors who are not with the times and they're teaching us older things. They don't give us a chance to interact with anything new. So the fact that you opened up to that and the fact that you allowed that interaction to occur, I think that your class should be given nationally because it really welcomes um, uh, a growing perspective from both angles. So thank, thank you for you. the yep. opportunity. Thank you. Yep. Thank of the racially motivated hate crime offenders, the largest percentage is white, 48%. And then black, 24%. Um, I just want to give you a sense of the many types of hate groups that have been studied that lead to the things I'm telling you about. And I think it's important to look at these lists and realize these are very leftist groups, very rightist groups, different religions. All right, so we're back at it again now. I, I was kind of looking at these classes as a three-course meal, correct? So we had the prosecutor of hate crimes, which was like the appetizer. Very delicious, very great, very informative. Now we're moving on to the meal. And in this case here, it's the psychology and victimology of hate crimes. Now, I know you guys organized a great event, and I, I just want to rec uh, mention something about the teachers, the, the instructors that you have mm -hmm. here. They're welcoming the interaction, which I actually see actually really gets the audience or the people that are listening to the course involved, and also embraces different perspectives as well as the evolution of where we're at. How important is it for that interaction that you see right now? I think I think it's it's essential. I'm, this, this segment is really important because, you know, earlier we spoke about prosecuting hate crimes. I think what a lot of people want to know is why do people hate, <laughs> which is the really important question because, because we, we recognize hate when we see it, we recognize hate speech when we hear it, 
but we want to know why do people do that? And I think that you know having these two uh, distinguished uh, people here today uh, gave us a lot of good insight into why that is, and 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 it really makes sense when you see it. It's sort of it's sort of stark, well, but, flowing, but it really makes a lot of sense. I believe you're flowing the classes in a certain way that introduces, gets them more involved. So there's an order to why you're doing it, and I and I love Absolutely. it by the way. It's very informative. You you can actually see the classes that are very involved. Um, so do you mind introducing me to the two people here? Yep, Teresa Andrews from St. Peter's University, Hi, and Dr. Sullivan. Uh, Nolan from uh, from um, Seton Hall University. All right, so now I noticed that this class was broken sort of in two parts where each person stepped up and did a section. Um, so just quickly, what was your section about? What was the title of it and, and, and what was it pertaining to? My section was pertaining to victims and um, understanding how the victims are affected by hate crimes and how they're able to overcome hate crimes and then also how the law enforcement can be involved um, with, in particular, I was talking about race, the African American community um, to improve or to bridge the gap in that relationship because currently there appears, because of historical reasons, um, to be a um, disconnect and um, distrust of law enforcement. And the way that that can happen, um, there have been several suggestions. One is through education, uh, law enforcement coming into the community, going to uh, different faith tradition, different churches, um, speaking with parents, um, going to schools, so that um, the African American community can connect with law enforcement, understand their role, and then also so that law enforcement can understand um, their role as well and understand uh, any biases that they may have uh, to be able to fairly service the community. Let me, let me ask a question. Also, when you brought up that topic, uh, of the relationship between African American community and uh, the police. I saw that there was definitely a lot of interest because I believe that even though it's being talked about, it's not being talked about in the way you present it, which is looking for a middle ground. Usually when you watch the news, it's left, it's right. Uh, and there's no attempt in the middle. And I always believe the middle is the harder ground. And then when you finally present it, uh, I believe there's people that are willing to try to bring a middle ground. Do you see a middle ground? I see a middle ground because we all need law enforcement in our communities. It's essential, it's critical. And at the same time, I think from the law en enforcement perspective, um, police and prosecutors need to understand the historical um, perspective of African American and why because of different um, experiences that the African American community have had, um, they would be dis dis um, distrustful of police and law enforcement. Even though law enforcement may be there to help, they're leery and suspicious um, because of, of past actions and because of what they see in the media. So if there is more dialogue between African Americans and police officers, honest dialogue, if there are more efforts to um, have coalitions and cooperate with each other, then I think that there will be a middle ground that each will recognize um, and appreciate the other and, and be able to interact in a, on a more positive basis. And you know, oh, uh, and that's why, and that's why, why these forums are, are important because I think, I think right now in America, everybody's sort of screaming over each other and nobody's really speaking to each other and it's getting lost in the noise and these and these forums are important so that we can very calmly and in a very scientific way sort of delve into a, a very a very very serious and you know touchy subject right and it's funny i actually sat down in political nation with with sharpton uh, a month back i believe it was and we talked about advocacy on both ends you know all because i believe in one side doesn't mean i'm against the other side it just means that we need to work together all because i may say okay well this is what law enforcement needs we know for a fact it's never an isolation of what the community needs it's right. a partnership and I believe that people are afraid to work with that partnership because it's hard it's hard it takes time it takes effort and it literally is a lot more um, it, it takes a lot more time than I, I believe that that people are willing to put into they want instant results this is an instant result this is something that's going to take time take effort and at the end it's all going to be worth it because anything that's successful it requires work 
and effort. And I really right. do agree with what you were trying to present. You were trying to present the middle ground, and I believe that's courageous at this point, especially when you have people that only want to stand on the left and the right. And there's people that's like yourself that's providing a course like this that says, wait a second, let me be unique here. But I promise you, eventually, people will start seeing that uniqueness, and eventually the middle ground will be the only ground, I, I, I believe. And that's why Dr. Nolan made a, made a great point earlier about identifying biases and how people and why people are biased because in essence we're all biased and, and you know we need to sift, sift through those biases and then sort of figure out how we can discard the bad ones and, Which definitely and keep the good ones because I, I was saying earlier that I'm a Notre Dame fan so you're an Ohio State <laughs> fan so I, I'm entitled to my bias against uh, you know And even awareness of biases, um, if you're aware of your own bias it helps you to not act on it so you, you, if you start realizing your prejudices because we all have some you cannot discriminate because you can be aware, wait, I shouldn't take this action, I know I'm biased. Well, I know that there's a lot of law enforcement right now that's actually trying to train officers on biases, trying to make them pick up and saying, listen, you may not know this is occurring, but therefore, let's show you, you know, the implicit bias, I believe right. it would be. Um, now, you provided another perspective, and this perspective is geared towards the victim. And what I liked about your class was you're teaching officers how to deal with victims uh, that may have went through a recent hate crime. So if we're giving advice to the officers that may watch this, what advice would you give them to uh, deal with someone who recently went through a horrific hate crime? Well, as we were talking about today, one of the big things is once you have been a victim of any crime, but particularly a hate crime, um, you have this real sense of a lack of control over your own life. This has happened to you, you've done everything right, this has happened just because of the color of your skin or your religion, and, and that can lead to um, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, even if it's not a mental illness, it can lead to this sort of, you, you feel very stuck. What um, anyone in the criminal justice system, from, from uh, police officers throughout the system, can do with a victim is to give them a sense of control at any point you can, if you can let them make decisions. I mean, as small as, do you want me to interview here or at the station? Do you want to sit here or here? Um, do you need a break? Like letting them have control in any small way is really important. Um, also connecting them with their natural support system, making sure they've got family, friends, if they're part of a religious community, um, get that going. Um, encourage them to get professional help. So just providing this sort of support. Um, also um, normalizing is really important because you will have seen many victims and the range of reactions that people have to being a victim. And all of those are normal in the face of an abnormal situation. Often a victim feels very strange, like I'm re reacting in this really strange way. If you can assure them, nope, you're acting perfectly normal, normally in the face of this abnormal situation. So you would agree that in order to prosecute, obviously, a hate crime, there's got to be some work in relationship between the victim and the law enforcement professional who's trying to... Absolutely. The victim must feel that he or she has control in that situation. So making that person a part of the process to the degree that's possible, obviously. Right, and if I, if I may ask, I mean, are we moving towards that direction now? Is that why we're doing classes like this? Because maybe before there wasn't that, I'm gonna say empathy, not sympathy, but I'm gonna say there's not that, there wasn't that empathy towards the victim and their plight? Yeah, and I think we heard that earlier in Kathleen Hawley's talk today, where she was talking uh, quite a bit about um, bringing the victim into the decisions she was making as a, a prosecutor. Um, so I think at every level that is starting to happen. And I would also like to add that that's law in New Jersey that because of the constitutional amendment that we have, that we have to consider the victim, that victims have certain rights and they need to be part of the criminal justice system because they are the ones who have been um, negatively affected. Yes. Live well, and relive the consequences yes. of, yeah. yeah. You yes. know what, before, before we close, I, there was actually another question I would like to bring up, and it was in regards to making sure the victim's okay with any deals that are being offered to the person that committed the crime. How important is that? It's important that they're heard. Yes. Um, the prosecutor has the final say, but it's important that, um, and the amendment, the constitutional amendment in New Jersey requires that the prosecutor apprise them of, of the process, what's happening, and they are allowed to talk with the prosecutor, and they're like allowed to go and uh, view the trial, what's happening in the case, and before any decisions made, they are allowed to give a victim impact statement, which talks about what effect this crime has had on them, uh, economically, emotionally, psychologically, um, 
in order for the prosecutor to make an informed decision about how the prosecutor is going to go forward, yeah, I, I, and also the judge. Yeah, what's great about that is I think that would be one of the, a lot of people when they look at the crimes, a lot of people don't realize that if there is a deal that's being offered to the person that's committed the crime, that uh, on your end here, the people that are prosecuting the crime, they have talked to the victim and they had made the victim aware of what was going on, uh, mm -hmm. and again, based on the details that you mentioned. Sure, and, as, and from the perspective of a psychologist, everything that Teresa was just talking about is about making the victim feel like he or she has some control, which will, um, in the aggregate, positively impact their mental health. Okay. Um, Bob, we offer victim impact through the whole the whole process at the beginning, uh, at sentencing, and even on the back end. The parole victim input is essential really important. And, and 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 constitutionally guaranteed. And that's why we're doing a video like this. That's why we're doing a, a, a conference like this because this is information that's not out there. So it's good, and it's not. It's not secretive information, it's just people just are not either asking the right questions or they're kind of just going with their confirmation bias, because I, you know, I was listening to your class. So <laughs> as always, um, I thought your class was amazing, very interactive, very informative. Again, I mentioned it a lot, but I do agree with a seminar like this and just building the interaction, showing people the evolution, showing the, the learning on both ways, you know, right. questions, answers, I, we can learn both ways. I agree that conferences like this shouldn't just stop here. Sure. They should continue exactly. forward. And this, the mental health community also can learn from being a part of this as well. We have a lot to learn because sometimes we say, oh, this must be done, but it can't be. Well, so. that, that's the backbone of, a, I, I agree, uh, with the NJACA. We believe in cross-perspective training, which we believe that there's multiple parts to the picture here. We, we know that, and we believe that once we start under, understanding each other's perspective, knowing the goal, well, we all can get to the goal together as opposed to separate and then wondering why the finished picture looks and like a mess. And that's what we're trying yes. to do. If you look at the crowd today, there are people from law enforcement, people from corrections, people from parole, people from the provider community, you know, from the whole, everybody who, who touches the community is here today. And it's really important because you're not going to, you're not going to sculpt solutions if you don't hear every perspective from all the people involved in it. And I would also add that I'm part of the faith community, so that is so critical to, to African American community, but not just to the African American community. Um, people's faith to traditions, traditions have a lot to do with their positive recovery. Mm -hmm. and, and if I may, just in closing, uh, there's another thing that happens with just bringing all departments together is the respect we wind up having. And I believe that right now, uh, especially in, in, in realms of corrections on a national level, you got multiple departments that aren't just working, they're not working together. Uh, there's, there's just some type of animosity, whether it's surface, you know what it is, or it's covert, it's just animosity that's there. And I think this is an effort to start beginning that road of understanding and ultimately bringing together a, a common goal that's based out of respect for what each other does and the mission for what needs to be accomplished. So again, uh, great, 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 great instruction, great class. You have to let everybody know it's in your area organization, there's a shooting going on. If there was a shooting going on, just maybe in another room here, it might not sound like a gunshot inside of the building. If you're outside, you may not hear that it's happening inside. It does not matter, matter that your name is John Smith or any other name, it does not matter. Really what matters is that the offender selected you because you're African American, because you're Korean, because you're Jewish, because you're handicapped, because you're gay, because you're transgender. And if that happens, that would be all right, so the event has concluded, and I would like to say it's another success. Now, I, I, I always forget specifics, so I know that NJACA, part of the, I always remember NJACA, so I'm going to give it to Sherry, because Sherry will make sure everybody gets their proper respect. But first off, we got to thank you, Sherry Sandler, because if it wasn't for you and the partnership, I know you had some people you want to thank as well, but I'm going to thank you, and then you can thank whoever you got to thank. Uh, but I want to thank you, because you always organize great events, and you always make sure that it's what the people want. And again, I, I, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, NJACA, we're committed to providing quality networking and training opportunities to criminal justice practitioners uh, working within New Jersey. And we do that quite often by partnering with other professional organizations. Um, it's so important to have that kind of dialogue with other practitioners. It's, it's one thing to peruse the internet looking for information to participate in webinars, but it's a whole different experience when you participate in training events in person, um, we had some great speakers today. You could see the engagement, the interaction amongst the crowd. Uh, there were a lot of questions. It was very interactive and dynamic. And that's why NJACA prides itself on establishing those partnerships. So today our partners were the 
New Jersey Association of Criminal Justice Educators, as well as Seton Hall University, the Division of Continuing Education. Um, and they were great partners and everybody brought something to the table today. Um, I also want to thank you, our treasured board member, NJACA, um, fierce corrections advocate, um, sharing information, spreading information, spreading the word, getting people talking, getting the dialogue going. That's what our organization is all about and you're such a great part of it. Well, I, I got to say something, Sherry. Uh, NJACA with the partnership from Seton Hall and I, again, you know the specific names, I get kind of lost, but I'm talking about all elements here. We're, we're seeing something that we're pioneering something great. It's, it's really we're promoting a diverse background where we're trying to promote people from different backgrounds coming together as one to ultimately get to the same mission. And we, we talked about that before, you know, we talked about getting people like, even just corrections alone, again, that's my background, but again, we can, we can bring that out here as well, but specifically with corrections, multiple departments working together as one, same mission, same goal, learning from each other. And here, I see these classes that are going on and there's an interaction that's providing the multiple perspectives. You know, you're getting questions from different fields and the instructors are answering it which Absolutely. means that they're involved with the evolution of where that field is going. So, and, and if I may, uh, from someone with uh, obviously an educator's background, how do you like the, 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 the kind of like the balance now between education and, and the law enforcement field? I, I thought it really was um, impressed upon everybody, frankly, at this conference. I thought the speakers were clearly uh, experts in their field. We were happy, we were happy to sponsor them. And um, we'd have to you know, continue to do these kind of partnerships in the future. I thought it was you know, very, very good though. Excellent. And, and NJACA, we, we want to thank, thank uh, Seton Hall University again, the Criminal Justice Educators Association. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do is, you know, we have this diverse group and we're trying to get the word out there and we're trying to do these training sessions and we're trying to break silence. You know, basically, you know, years ago, everybody was doing their own thing and nobody was really speaking to anybody. Now everybody in the, in, in the industry is speaking to each other because if, if we're going to get better outcomes, we need to get everybody involved so we can build a better solution, and that takes a lot. And education is, is key right. to everything. That and, we're I, trying and I to saw do. a lot of the uh, a lot of the speakers in terms of you know particularly with Ed Moore of Homeland Security, um, and I could tell from you know taking sort of just a survey of, of the uh, of the registrants, the attendants, that they really got into it. It was very engaging. I thought the discourse was excellent. Um, so it really hit home, I thought, particularly in you know the kind of circumstances in the world that you know we find ourselves living in today. So. Um, I thought it was very educational. I thought it was, you know, and, you know, frankly, I think from the feedback that I got, you know, anecdotally, as people were coming and going and, you know, touching base with me, I thought that, you know, it really hit the mark and they really had a great experience here. And well, again, we're happy to do it. Well, if I may also, I mean, besides just the event itself, the instructors, whatever it is, there is a moderator, right, who helps with the flow of things. Would anybody know who that moderator? Oh, <laughs> Dr. John Patekas. I, I forgot about No, 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 you, you can't forget about you. Over 50 years in the business. Um, so how did you feel the event well from, uh, went from your perspective? Well, I, I echo pretty much what, what everybody said. I, I think the other thing to be gained from this, and you know, what I used to tell students, is that what other information you get, now you're getting the factual information from the practitioner, the prosecutor, et cetera. Go out and share that information with others, because you know where most of the public gets their information is from the media, and we know that it's not always complete. You know, They'll put the story on, police officer uh, shoots a, a juvenile or whatever, Yeah, but they don't know all the background information. So uh, <clears throat> we want them to spread that information to others once they get the factual information here. So that's always another goal. So we have 60 people here today. They all were attentive. I saw them taking notes even, etc. So uh, I'm hoping when they go out there, they share that information, you know, with, with their colleagues, their friends, their family. Uh, and that's how you improve the system. Uh, somebody was talking about the system, one of the speakers, and uh, I said, yeah, but I, I've noticed a lot of positive changes. This is my 50th year in, in the system, you know, and, uh, you know, it's a lot different than it was 50 years ago. A lot more professionalized. Students are much more educated. The training has increased in the academies. The technology has been a, a godsend. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, there have been a lot of improvements. Uh, is it a perfect uh, system? No, it's not. No system is perfect, but we've come a long way and we're trying to address some of those issues. So that's the purpose, I think, of these conferences, and I think we accomplished that today. Well, I, I, I agree, and, I, and I, I like seeing people with experience as instructors, and, and I know we always talk about evolution of our system, but I also like to say there's evolution of the educational system, and the reason why I'm saying that is I see more people with experience as they get closer to retiring, grabbing those degrees, and then being welcome in colleges like this to teach. How important is the experience with the degree and, and having that put out there at your school, like people with the experience, the degree, and then going out there and teaching to the young minds? Well, I think, you know, even speaking personally, I always thought that you know professionals like uh, like John 
you know, who have some practical, who have the practitioner's experience who come into the classroom, I think it's a great balance in terms of that classroom discussion, in terms of what you're reading in the text, and you balance that as like, okay, look, you know, here's theoretically the principles and the concepts that you're going to pick up uh, in that forum, but let me give you a little bit of my personal experience in terms of how it works in the field. Some of it, you know, rings true, and some of it is not necessarily um, as it would be, as it would appear conceptually in that text. So I think it's 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 a great balance when you have the folks who have that academic uh, credential, but at the same time, and uh, and importantly, have also that practitioner and practical experience to bring um, that kind of broad breadth of experience to the. Uh, to the students. And if I may, that's also just in, in general, that's an invite for those that are in their field and they want to make a difference. Well, it's not just in the field itself, it's in the classroom because that's where people will be getting educated. So, you know, you can get them when they're young and start giving them a perspective of experience balanced with uh, academia. Now, just in closing, um, I know we have some future events coming up uh, with the New Jersey chapter of the ACA and obviously hopefully some future events tied in with uh, Seton Hall and of course our moderator John Patekis. Do you have anything you want to say in closing in regards to anything going on in the future? Well, at our next board meeting I'm sure we're going to be discussing next year's, uh, next year's events uh, where we, we will be doing a couple more of these, these style events. Uh, we also have uh, MASCA conferences, not going to be New Jersey next year but the year after we'll probably be, hopefully be hope, uh, hosting the uh, MASCA conference again. Uh, because New Jersey just has it, it's a great place because because they're, it's kind of like an incubator for all these great ideas. And at the end of the day, New Jersey is benefiting from it because we are leading the uh, the nation in de-incarcerating our prisons. We have the largest percentage drop of any other state, and at the same time, we've lowered our real recidivism rate and our uh, and our real crime rate. So that's happening because of of all these types of things that you're seeing, all these si breaking down of silos, education, getting everybody involved. So it has real results, and we're going to move forward. Right, and I, I got to say, you know, and again, you know, working in the shadows of justice, a lot of people don't know the real work that goes on behind the wall, and it's good to uh, see, I, I mean, I believe there were some students here, they're bringing that perspective out, which is great because, uh, believe it or not, what goes on in television has been edited for entertainment reasons, but what really goes on is work. It's work to make sure that those that come in get released with a better mindset. And just in closing, I would like to thank those brave men and women out there who, from all levels, from all departments, from whether you're behind, uh, behind the wall or on the streets, just for trying to make society better and making sure that what comes in based on whatever act goes out with a different mindset. Correct? Yep. All right, guys, as always, it's Tear Talk. Stay safe. Love you guys, and thank you guys for doing what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Hey, thanks, Anthony.